Good morning, guys, and greetings from Cordova Pass. I got up at 1 a.m. this morning so that I could get to the trailhead for the West Spanish Peak. So the West Spanish Peak is another 13er in Southern Colorado in the Crista de Sagra Range if memory serves me right. Driving up here through the night, saw something I've never seen before in the midst of clear sky, you can see the moon and the stars and it's all very like peaceful, right? There was like a random thunder cloud and it's so crazy to see. There's no thunder and I can just see like chaos in the middle of like complete serenity. I think I'm now in bear country. I don't know, I just have to make lots of noise and clap and if worse comes to worse, I'll have to punch him in his nose. Yeah, it may sound funny, but that is actually the official advice. If you encounter a black bear that fancies a, a fight, speak to you when I'm on the road. All right, so it's just been 10 minutes into the hike and now we've just come out into a bit of an opening where for the first time I can see the West Spanish Peak. So we're going to get to the top of that. That's clouds and I'm here, which means I'm above the clouds. That's incredible. Just over an hour into the hike. So the beginning was all kind of flat and kind of easy. The trail then kind of fades as we get to the significant checkpoint where there's like a massive cairns, which we just passed like a couple minutes ago. <laughs> as you can see, uh, it's this is where the pain begin. Temperatures are perfect, wind, very, very calm. And uh, just as the weather forecast predicted, pretty much clear skies. Just going to take a bit of a breather, drink some water, and then uh, let's start the most difficult part of the hike. Then another 20 to 30 minutes. I know the background looks the same, but <laughs> I have made progress. Yeah, it is steep, but it's harder because of the loose scree in the talus. When you're hiking up, you're kind of slipping. And back down a little bit with each step. I'm at the summit of West Spanish Peak and I'm the only person on top of this mountain. This is insane. I fulfilled all my dreams of wanting to walk on the ridge line of, of like a, a really tall, of a tall mountain. It's insane walking on the ridge of the mountain. It's crazy. This is my number one favorite mountain in Colorado. The views is unlike anything I've ever seen. I feel really like far away. I don't know how to describe it. Wow, if only I could fly a drone here just to show you guys the perspective of where I am right now. It's absolutely insane. Absolutely insane. I just can't put into words what this feels. Right, I'm just going to absorb the views, eat some lunch, and then uh, hopefully I'll talk you guys through one of my poker sessions from earlier last week. Stay tuned. I literally feel like I could stay here all day. I could literally just sit here and it's just so calm. Can't hear anything. It's the ultimate peace, ultimate solitude. These moments are the highlights of my life and moments that I will never, ever forget. For me, in my opinion, to make the most of your life is to gather as many of these memories as you can. The more memories you have, I think the more fulfilled you feel. So for me, the reason why I do this, because, well, not only because I, I love it, I mean, granted, it's not for everyone. I think the point is to gather as many of these memories that you treasure the most in your life and actively pursue it. It is really hard. It's, it's not easy because we all procrastinate right and maybe I should firstly say not everyone has first and foremost the opportunity to do things like this they may not have the the freedom but for those of you who are watching this video and I will assume that at least 
most of you do have the means, the time and the opportunity to really do the things that you really want to do in life, things that will truly make you happy, gather those memories. The only thing worse than not having the opportunity is having the opportunity to do these amazing things and not doing it. The reason why I'm talking about this sort of stuff is because I guess I'd like to also inspire people like yourselves watching this video to follow your dreams and do the things that make you happy. So the session that I'm going to talk through in this video, the table that we joined was already a rock game. So we dove straight into a 2-5-10 game. Stacks were deep, action was loose. I literally just arrived at the table, sat down, my chips were still in my rack. The dealer was like, do you want a hand? I was like, yeah, sure. And then I picked up Ace King. So we opened Ace King under the gun to $30. And the action, in fact, folded all the way to the big blind, who was Elias. Elias, and then three bet from the big blind. I think it was like a hundred or so dollars. We called, flop comes king high. Elias, C bet for small, I call. Turns a brick, he checks, I then bet. Elias calls. River comes another brick, Elias checks, and then I jam. Uh, so I think Elias had about 1,000 to start the hand. And then Elias went deep into the tank before making the side call and we want to stack very early doors in our session. So unfortunately you just had to hear me talk through the hand without actually seeing any um, video clip and that's because unfortunately <laughs> that was the very first hand that I played and I didn't have my camera set up or anything so I thought I should note that uh, before I move on to the first proper hand that I'm going to be discussing in this session. Right so in this first interesting videoed hand uh, I should say of this session. There is a limp from under the gun and then early position opens the pot to $45. The cutoff then makes the call before the action folds all the way to me in the big blind and I look down at pocket kings. So I decide to put in the squeeze to $210. Under the gun quickly makes the fold. Early position tanks before then also deciding to fold. And then the action is now on the cutoff, who again goes into the tank before eventually settling on a call. So effective stacks here are about 1.3, 1.4K, and uh, we have villain covered. So we are now heads up to the flop, and the dealer puts out three, five, five with two spades. Pretty much a perfect flop for our hand. We should pretty much be C betting our full range uh, in the spot. So that's what I decided to do. I decided to continue for a small C bet of just $150. Action's now on Villain, who now goes into the tank before then cutting out some chips, which to me doesn't look like calling chips. Nope. Villain decides to put in a raise to $330. Just pretty much just like a, a min click. So as soon as I saw this raise, in my mind, what this means is Villain is just putting out a feeler raise. The action is now on us. And I think in this spot, I don't like continuing with just a call here because if we do call, then what would make most sense is that we snap check the turn and then we let Villain drive the action. And given it's just a small raise, this could just be like a small blocker bet just to freeze the action on the turn and get a free river card. Given that I do have some ASEX or of spades which I would pretty much never just be calling here versus this flop raise I would always be jamming here I decide to balance out the times when I do have an ace of spades with a strong overpair and therefore I decide to rip the rest of my stack in for 1.1k effective so we managed to fade the snap call uh, which is to be fair not really surprised given the way the hands played out I don't think we are ever beat in the spot but essentially I guess I'm just trying to target some pocket eights pocket nines pocket tens and maybe even some nut flush draws which our opponent could have in the spot just waiting for villain to make his decision and after tanking for like a, a minute or so villain eventually decides to make the fold so we get to dragging quite a nice pot here especially after having won a stack in our very first hand Thank you. Right, so on to the next interesting hand. There is a limp from under the gun, and then early position limps, and then there's also another limp from middle position, before the action then falls to us in the cutoff, and I look down at pocket queens. So I decide to put in a raise here to $50, the action falls to the big blind, who is the rock in this hand, who makes the call, under the gun calls, and then the other two players, strangely enough, make the fold. We are now three ways going to the flop, which comes king, 10, five with two diamonds. And I think we have the queen of diamonds on our hand. The action checks to me and I decide to put in a small C bear of $50. The big blind then makes the call 
and the under the gun player makes the fold. Granted there is a scare card on the flop, namely the king. Given that we put in quite a small C bet sizing on the flop means that not only are we going to get called by king x hands, we're also going to get called by a bunch of other weaker hands such as 10x hands, some smaller pocket pairs and some flush draws. So at this point I'm still reasonably confident that we have the best hand going to the turn card. So we're off to the turn card and the dealer puts out an offsuit king. Villain now decides to lead out but he does choose a very small sizing of just $50. Seeing quite a small bet sizing, and given that this player who is someone who I perceive to be an old type ABC type player, against these player types, I have a bunch of respect for, maybe sometimes a little bit too much respect. In addition to 10X hands, which would make the most sense given this line that he's taken. I think this player type could also have some king x hands that he would also be mixing in as turn leads after just check calling the flop. Given all of the above, I decide to not raise this opponent and instead I decide to continue with just a flat call. We are now off to the river card and the river just comes another brick and then fill in in the big blind again decides to lead out but he decides to choose the exact same sizing of $50. So in this spot, of course, we are never ever folding. The only question is, do we raise? I made an exploit in this hand that I was gonna give quite a lot of respect to this villain for having some king X hands that he would be playing this way. The worst hand that I'm putting villain on right now is ace 10. Maybe you could even have a hand like pocket jacks. In this instance, I did unfortunately just decide to continue with a just call. Villain then tables ace 10 suited and then I table the winner with pocket queens. So yeah, in hindsight, definitely gave way too much credit for villain in the big blinds. Definitely lost out on some value here. There go. Swiftly moving on to the next interesting hand. There is an open from under the gun to $25. The action then falls all the way to me in the big blinds and I yet again look down at pocket kings. Villain who opened from under the gun is playing reasonably short stack with just under $500. So in this scenario, given that Villain is not fully stacked, I am of course going to be three betting. However, I am going to be choosing a smaller sizing. So in this case, I decide to put in a three bet to just $75. Villain then takes a quick look at my stack just to make sure if I've got him covered, which I obviously do, before he then decides to jam the rest of his stack in. I, of course, snap call and then Villain announces that he's got pocket queens and he shows his hand and then I say, I've got you and then I table my hand. So we are now off to see all five cards. The dealer then puts out the flop with just like ace, jack, eight. So far so good. But then the turn comes an offsuit queen, but then the river comes an offsuit 10. So we river the nuts to steal the lead and take down this part. Right, so in this hand, the action falls all the way to me in the cutoff and I look down at pocket sevens. So I decide to make the standard open to $30. The action then folds to the big blind who makes the call before it then folds back to the hijack who is the rock in this hand who takes a peek of his cards before also deciding to come along for a call. So we are now going three ways to the flop and the flop comes seven, six, four with two clubs. Ashton checks to me and in this spot, given that we are very, very deep with um, both opponents in this hand, like over 2K deep, and also given that we have a hand that's definitely strong enough to call raises. Against more tricky opponents, I lean more towards c betting small so I can induce some check raises and then build the pot that way rather than betting big and then risking a high likelihood of us just getting flat called. But I think with a hand like top set, we like to build the pot a lot more than if we had a hand like bottom set. I think there is a massive difference here between top set and bottom set here, which could mean the difference between winning or losing your whole stack. So in this case, I decide to put out a small C bet of just $30. The big blind makes the call and then the hijack folds. So we are now off to the turn card, which the dealer puts out the ace of spades. Big blind quickly checks and now the action's on us. In this spot, given we didn't get check raised, which I think means we had the best hand on the flop. And moreover, given my read on this opponent, I'm putting villain on a massive draw here. I've seen this player in similar spots earlier in this session where he also had massive draws out of position. And I noticed that he played these hands very passively. We are definitely going to fire a second shell here. And I think in terms of sizing, we definitely want to go massive here. And so in this case, I decided to go for an over bet 
and I decide to put out a bet of $175. Villain is now visibly very pained. He really looks like he's struggling with this decision and from my perspective this is not someone who I think actually Hollywood's much so in my mind this is a pretty honest reaction. Villain does tank for quite a while before then eventually settling on a call. By us overbetting the turn card we've essentially reduced Villain's range now to hands like Ace X of clubs or 7-5 of clubs, 9-5 of clubs. So essentially massive draws which have a decent amount of equity against us and to a lesser frequency some two pairs and perhaps some pocket sixes or pocket fours. I feel like I've defined Villain's range pretty narrow here and therefore I pretty much know exactly the cards that I'm trying to dodge here. So we are now off to the river card and the dealer puts out the three of clubs. Completes the flush, completes the straight. Nice. Villain in the big blind now goes into the tank, which is obviously not a great news for me. And to be honest, I feel like I already know what's coming here. Villain then decides to grab some of his chips and then he decides to bet $225. And I waste very little time and I just snap fold. So yeah, nice catch on the river, sucks. Nice hand. Right, so in this next hand, there is a new player who joined the table on my direct left. He starts the hand with about $700 and is also another player who I perceive to be a weak, tight ABC player. The action falls all the way to me in the small blind, actually, and I look down at four six of spades. So I decide to put in a raise to $40. The big blind makes the call and the under the gun player, who is the rock in this hand, folds. So we are now going heads up to the flop and the flop comes ace jack five with one spade. I decide to continue for a small C bet of $30. Villain then wastes little time before making the call. Not great news, but I'm definitely not giving up yet. And there are a lot of turn cards, which I'm thinking about to help me continue barreling on the turn. For the turn card, the dealer puts out the eight of spades. So in this scenario, especially given that Villain's not super deep, I don't feel like I need to size up on this turn card here to fold out most of his range that would have continued on the flop. So just queen jack, jack 10, a pair of fives. So I decide to continue barreling for $75. But then to my horror, Villain snap raises to $200. On my mind, I'm like, okay, fine. So you don't have a Jack X, you don't have a 5X. And to be honest, I don't even put you on an Ace X. So I think you have at least aces up or a set. And given Villain's chosen quite a small sizing here, and he's got about four, or $500 left in the stack, I think we have the right price here to peel on this turn card to try and make our hand and given this player type in my mind I think I also have the implied odds because if we do make a hand I'm pretty confident that I'm going to get paid off here in full. With this in mind I decide to continue with a call and on the river the dealer puts out an offsuit 10. Sorry. I snap check and then villain snap jams his stack in and I of course snap fold. It just sucks that we couldn't make our hand um, otherwise, we would have um, taken out a nice pot. From the casino to the star, yeah. where they picked you up. Yeah, the... so, so in this hand, there is limp from early position. Middle position also decides to limp. And the action falls to me on the button. And I look down at queen 10 off suit. I decide to put in a raise to $40. The action then falls to the small blind, who is the rock in this hand. And he decides to make the call. Early position calls and middle position also calls. We are now four ways to the flop, which comes king, 10, eight with two diamonds. The action checks to me on the button. And I think in this spot, we should be checking a lot more often than betting here, especially given we don't have any diamonds and we don't have the best kicker to go with our 10 and we are still multi-way. So I also decide to check back. So we are now off to a free river card and the river comes an offsuit 10. The action again checks all the way to me on the button, so I decide to now delay C bet for $75. The small blind quickly folds, but then the early position player now goes deep into the tank. Villain decides that he wants to play for some more money, and he decides to put in a min click raise to $150. The middle position player quickly gets out the way, and the action is now back on us. So effective stacks here, I think Villain only has like six or seven hundred dollars left in his stack. To be honest, I really hated this raise. When we get raised here in a spot where I perceive there to be no bluffs, Queen 10 doesn't really perform very well here because the most likely hands that Villain is going to be check raising here, especially for a min click, is Queen 10, most likely 
ace 10 and i also give villain credit here for some full houses here to also have us beat in game my first reaction was well okay so we've got trips here and villain's not super deep here so should i just rip it in and just like you know if you got it you got it however i'm really glad that i took some time to think about the spot because as i've just discussed now i don't see there to be many hands if any that we beat here the only hand that we beat here is jack 10 or 10 9 versus queen 10 king 10 ace 10 pocket eights which we lose to one other thought that i had in this hand was that the other added benefit to not raising or getting the money in on the turn here given that we could already be beat here was that if we just called and i thought the river came like uh, another diamond uh, which would be a scare card for um, his 10x hands then i actually considered turning my trip 10s into a bluff if villain checks river so having considered all of the above i decided to continue with a flat call so we are now off to the river card the dealer puts out an offsuit five villain now goes into the tank before then deciding to put out another bet of 200 dollars. i guess i should be thankful that villain's not decided to jam here as that would put us in a much tougher spot this is pretty much crying for a call here i think i'd fold jack 10 i think queen 10 even though it's ambitious would probably be the weakest hand that i would be calling here i eventually decide to make the cycle and villain shows king 10 of clubs for a turned boat so yeah i wasn't really surprised to see this hand and uh, sucks that villain hit the gin turn card to get paid <laughs> In this hand, the action falls to me on the button and I look down at Queen 10 offsuit. I decide to put in a standard open to $30. The small blind calls and the big blind, who is also the rock in this hand, also calls. We are now three ways going to the flop and the flop comes seven, eight, nine with two spades. And I think we have a queen of spades in our hand. Ashing quickly checks to me. And in this spot with a hand like queen 10, I think we want to see bet for a slightly larger sizing here. We can fold out a bunch of hands that have us beat already, such as ace highs and some one pair type hands, which we have a lot of equity against. Therefore, I decide to continue for a C bet of $40. The small blind makes the call, but then the big blind decides to put in a raise to $150. So when the big blind raises, I don't think Villain has a flush draw. I think he most likely has a made hand. Most likely I'm putting Villain on sets and flopped straights. And given that we've got a queen 10, I think more likely than not, Villain has probably flopped the lower end of the straight, if he did flop a straight at all. So in this spot, if we're going to be playing against two pairs, sets and inferior straights, then our hand doesn't perform that badly against it, especially given we do have a spade on our hand. This is a very dynamic board. We have position and there are a lot of cards that can either improve our hand or actually be bluff outs for us to outplay our opponent on later streets. After thinking this through, I decide to make the call and then this small blind, to my surprise, also decides to call. When small blind calls here, I am putting small blind on a monster draw or sets. So we are now off to the turn card and the dealer puts out an offsuit eight, which pairs the board. Not really a card that I wanted to see. Small blind quickly checks, and then the big blind then goes into the tank. He is hesitating, shows a bit of an honest reaction that he doesn't like the card as well, before then playing a check. When I see this action in front of me, big blind now obviously doesn't have a boat. By powers of deduction, I think big blind most likely has flopped a straight and doesn't like the turn card. And now the range advantage now shifts to myself and the small blind for being able to have boats. The small blind is what complicates this hand for me because if we were heads up, then I think I would be turning this hand into a bluff. But given that the small blind continued and his range is most likely going to consist of sets on the flop, I don't think any bluffs here are going to work. Unfortunately, I decide to wave the white flag and check back. We are now off to the river card. The dealer puts out the jack of spades, which now completes our straight and also completes the flush. Small blind then doesn't hesitate betting like $250 into two opponents. The big blind tanks before eventually releasing his cards. And for me, we rivered the nut straight on a flushy paired board. So basically our hand is pretty much dust here. Not really much of a decision here for us. So I also decide to make the fold. Right, so that concludes all the interesting hands from my session last Monday. And when all is said and done, we managed to end the session up 
$1,359. Great start to the week. However, last week was actually quite tough for us. So unfortunately, after such a strong start, the rest of the week was pretty mediocre. We did actually still manage to end the week up. However, we only just won 87 bucks. I can actually start to see some big clouds forming now. In fact, you can probably just see one right behind me, which if you rewind the video, you might actually see that there weren't any clouds at all. That's it from me. Take care. See you in the next video. Peace.